regard the genuineness of the president and his policies vis-a-vis as it concerns the Igbos. Governor Hope Ugodima maintains Igbos are better off in the United Nigeria. For us to create a safe working environment, we believe strongly that we need to begin to in place measures. Federal government employees to show proof of vaccination to gain access to workplaces with effect from the 1st of December 2021. We should diversify our economy, go into agriculture holistically. Senate passes 2022 appropriation bill for a second reading after two days of repeat debates. On Good Morning Nigeria today, we shall be exploring non oil taxes in Nigeria. The level of economic growth of any nation depends largely on the amount of revenue generated and channeled towards the development of a country. Unfortunately, the continued increase in government responsibilities and her inability to meet up with her financial challenges have forced the government to source for alternative revenue generation source. One of these challenges result from uh, increased uh, population sizes, infrastructural uh, decay, and of course the dwindling oil prices plus the prevailing inflationary situation uh, which erodes the value of funds otherwise available for the provision of uh, essential services to the people. Indeed, Kesley, and one of the sure ways of generating alternative revenue in Nigeria is tax. The non-oil sector has been the focus of government for revenue generation. According to the chairman, Federal Inland Revenue Service, Mohamed Nami, the non-oil sector recorded improved performance at 3.3 trillion naira within the fourth nine months of 2021, which had performed tax from the oil sector, totaling 950 billion at the same time. Now, Mohammed uh, Nami gave the information indicating that the use of technology had become a necessary tool uh, to improve revenues for all the three tiers of government. He also noted that the appreciation in oil revenue was a good pointer that the Nigerian economy was being diversified away from oil and could do better than uh, present. Indeed, they could do better, Kinsley, and the federal government is currently paying attention to such taxes as stamp duty, sales tax, consumption tax, and order, several orders in order to attract more revenues for the government. Now, despite the COVID-19 outbreak in uh, 2020, the FRS uh, is reported to have met 98% of its revenue target of well over 5 trillion naira, and this was a collection of uh, 4.9 percent. However, some analysts believe that the agency might not win its set target of uh, meeting the tax to GDP of 15 percent should the states win their battle against the FRS. And this, of course, in respect of the value of the tax. Yeah, and we're all looking forward to the outcome of that battle, Kinsley. Right. Meanwhile, tax to GDP in Nigeria as estimated at 6%, which analysts say is low, as far from intensifying tax collections, Nigeria has relied on borrowing to sustain its economy, with available records revealing the federal government obtained an overdraft of about $16 trillion from the Central Bank of Nigeria in order to run the economy. Well, that's what's known as ways and means. Now, African Development Bank President uh, Dr. Akinomi Adesina, in his address at the midterm ministerial retreat last week, said, sorry, rather, that's on Monday this week, said that uh, the current challenge was one of uh, revenue uh, generation, urgent serious improvement, and concentration on the non oil sector. So, what is needed for sustained growth and economic resurgence? to improve revenue earning potential of the massive non-oil sector. What should be done to kickstart economic diversification with non-oil revenue? 
These questions and all the issues arising from non oil revenue generation is our focus today on Good Morning Nigeria as we explore non oil taxes in Nigeria. We have guests joining us to speak on these issues. You're welcome to Good Morning Nigeria. I am Jumai Yosef. And I'm Kingsley Yosadolov. I join my colleague Jumai to also welcome you to the program. As always, we are live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. In the course of the program, we have our regular complimentary segments. For now, here is our colleague, Tessie O'Neary, with the morning news. Good morning, Tessie. Good morning, Kingsley, and good morning, Jume. Good morning, Nigeria, and here is the morning news. Governor Hope Uzodema of Imo State has made a strong case for Indigo to resist any attempt at drafting the Southeast region on a coalition course with federal authorities under the guise of advocating for self-determination. Addressing journalists after an audience with President Muhammad Buhari, the governor maintains that Igbos are better off in a united and prosperous Nigeria, which the President Buhari presidency is determined to achieve. The people have discovered the genuineness of the president and his policies vis-a-vis -vis as it concerns the Igbos. And I have seen that it is only through national politics, which all, some of us have been serious advocates of, that the Southeast will rapidly develop. Edo State Government has resolved to key into the National Livestock Transformation Plan as a critical pathway towards ending Nigeria's farmer head crisis. Governor Gordon Obasaki, who disclosed this at a media briefing after an audience with President Muhammad Buhari, said for a state, anti-grazing law is not an option. We want to ensure that whatever laws we pass are laws that we can enforce. Um, we've had extensive consultations with our people, extensive town hall meetings, to deal with the issue that, yes, we do not want open grazing. It is outmoded, it's outdated. However, what are the options? If we are asking that we should now have ranches and these cattle should now be constrained to uh, specific areas, then who provides the land? Now to legislation. After two days of debate on the general principles of the 2022 appropriation bill, the Senate has passed it for second reading. The legislators emphasize on the expansion of railway lines across states, improved revenue generation, and adequate remittances into government coffers. Movements of goods and services along the corridors of our transportation nodes are very key to economic sustainability. Uh, most of our committees, honestly, are not uh, being very, very uh, effective in their role of oversighting MDS. We should diversify our economy, go into agriculture holistically. There's need for us to be very vigilant and oversight very closely to ensure that the taking off is successful. Sustaining the trajectory of infrastructural development, improving revenue generation and power supply, among others, took center stage as the House of Representatives commences debate on the 2022 budget proposal. The issue of agriculture, which is one of the major and key cardinal principles of this administration, Mr. Speaker, has also taken chunks of these resources to be invested in the 2022 appropriation bill. This is a budget that is responsible and responsive to the yearnings and concerns of gender and the vulnerable group in our society. We are ready to help Nigerian people to move forward. The Deputy Governor of Anambra State, Justin Ken Okeke of the All Progressives Grand Alliance, APGA, has defected to the All Progressives Congress, APC. The Chairman, Caretaker and Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee of APC and Governor of Yobe State, Neymar Labuni, has already presented Dr. Okeke to President Muhammad Buhari. I've been the Deputy Governor of Anambra State for the last seven and a half years. I don't think I've contributed positively the way I would love to contribute.
contribute to the society development. And I believe that I have a lot more to contribute to society. I know what I bring to the party is credibility, Mr. President. It takes a lot of courage for you to come out, bring along your supporters, and explain to the rest of the people that uh, this is the best direction to your geopolitical goal. This is the best solution for you. And from politics to health, with effect from 1st December 2021, federal government employees shall be required to show proof of COVID-19 vaccination or present a negative COVID-19 PCR test result done within 72 hours to gain access to their offices. Chairman of the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19 and Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, stated this at the national briefing. Now that we have sufficient vaccines available, I urge all Nigerians to approach the health facilities and get themselves vaccinated and not be bogged down by very misinformed theories and conspiracies that would deny our people the benefit that vaccines would avail them. Now to update on COVID, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control has confirmed 251 new cases of COVID-19 in the country. A breakdown of the new cases from 18 states and the FCT indicates that FCT recorded the highest number for the day with 78 new infections. Lagos follows with 46 cases, then Kaduna 27, Rivers recorded 21. Imo 16, Edo 13, Delta 12, and Plateau 10 cases. Others include Niger 7, Bauchi and Kwara have 6 each, Akwaibom 4, Benue 3, and Nasharawa with 2 cases. With the latest development, Nigeria now has 208,404 confirmed cases of COVID-19, out of which 196,000 123 were treated and discharged, while 2,761 persons have so far died of the virus. And that's the news for now. Good morning, Nigeria continues with Kingsley and Jomay after this break. Thanks for watching. You are watching Good Morning Nigeria. Next is business news as Minister of State Petroleum Resources, Dimitri Silva says, Appropriate pricing of gas is key to the success of the nation's push for decades of gas. Comfort Amadou reports on this and the minister's position on the hike in prices of cooking gas on business news. Oil prices dropped on Wednesday after a mixed finish in the previous session amid worries that soaring coal and natural gas prices in China, India and Europe will stoke inflation and slow global growth, reducing oil demand. A strong U.S. dollar trading near a one-year high also weighed on oil prices, and it makes oil more expensive for those holding of the currencies. Meanwhile, the Nigerian's Minister of State Petroleum Resources, Dimitri Silva, says availability and appropriate pricing of gas is vital to the achievement of Nigerian's push for decade of gas, while expressing dismay over the recent hike in prices of cooking gas in the country. He assured that government is looking into ways to ease the burden. What is mainly affecting uh, the gas pricing today also is foreign exchange. You know, the foreign exchange, a lot of uh, the gas is being imported. Uh, one of the things that uh, is being suggested is that we take out uh, VAT uh, from imported gas. Um, and that if we do that, it's going to crash the price of gas. And you know, whether we're going to take out the VAT as is being suggested, but while that is being contemplated, we also have to think of the local producers as well. Um, so we are looking at it. We are going to have meetings with uh, the gas producers and, of course, the importers of gas. And then we'll get a middle course and we'll take a decision that will be best for everybody. In other news, the African Development Bank has confirmed the appointment of Bajab Bunili Swazi Shabalala as the new senior vice president of the African Development Bank Group. The FDB president, Dr. Kimwemi Adeshina, says the appointment takes effect from 1st of November 2021. Shabalala was appointed by the bank president as the acting senior vice president in March 2020, 
following the retirement of the incumbent Charles Wamwa. Shabalala, a citizen of South Africa, has been the vice president of finance and chief financial officer of the African Bank. With business news, I'm Fort Amadou. Thank you very much, Comfort Amodo, for the business package. Up next is Newspaper Review. By service in the studio by beautiful morning to you. Thank you. To me, good morning. Good morning, Kesley. Goodbye. Good morning, Nigeria. That's right. We have a lot on our plate in the newspaper review today. Loaded newspaper for my headlines. Let's begin with the nation newspaper. Uh, above the name plate, we have banks dead deadline on dead customers. BVMs. You find details on page 11. Banks get deadline on dead customers. BVMs. Page 11, go six not for treatment in Germany or France. You find details on page six. Agency takes literacy campaign to Kogi and Yobe State. Details on page 27. Senate invites works ministry orders over foreign loan. Senate invites works ministry orders over foreign loans. You find all that on page four. Below the nameplate of the nation newspaper, Anambra 2021. Soludo may no fate at Supreme Court today. Be ruthless with criminal, IG tells officers. Mogalu urges electorate to vote ABC. You find details on page 26 and 20, page 2 and 27. 300 trillion fabric sector fund projected for national development plan with rider federal government to inject 50 trillion naira pdp chairman north party leaders consensus plan shaky pdp chairman north party leaders consensus plan shaky with speakers three geopolitical zones pick different candidates Mark, Ghana, Idris, withdraw. Who is running? And the zones. Iyocha Ayu, North Central. Ibrahim Shema, North West. Abdul Mizi, North East. And at the side plate of the nation newspaper, COVID-19, November deadline for federal workers to get vaccinated. With kickers, government relaxes restrictions on travelers from Brazil, Turkey, and South Africa. And you see the picture stories there. President Mohamed Buhari, second left, handing over the All Progressive Congress APC flag to Anambra State Deputy Governor in Kem Okeke at the presidential villa in Abuja yesterday. With them are APC Caretaker Committee Chairman and Yobe State Governor May Malabuni left and Imo State Governor Hope Uzodima. Seven suspected smugglers die in movie tanker fire. Details on page three, and court finds Fanny Kayode. You find that on page six. Yes, yes. Okay, we'll take a look also at the Punch newspaper. Above the uh, name plate, we have the following headlines. Rats fault budget deficit loans and $57 oil benchmark threatening MDAs. Reps fault budget deficit loans and $57 oil benchmark threatening MDAs. Sage budget condemned 700 billion naira National Assembly constituency projects in six years. Reps tackle banks avoiding probing to customs revenue remittance. Senate summons power ministry and others over Buhari loans and warns of sabotage. And two earpieces beside the name plate says amidst downward forecast, IMF increases Nigeria's growth prospect by 0.1%. Mongalu announces six-party plant measure hails if transmission of results. 
The news story has a double-decker headline and two riders say ZMA health workers differ as federal government plans ban on unvaccinated workers. Workers must be vaccinated or present negative tests as from December 1. That's according to the federal government. Available vaccine doses not sufficient, barring workers insensitive, says Joe Hesu. And then below the photographs there, Obasaki meets Buhari on ranching pond, backs e transmission of results. Water scarcity looms in FCT, board stops supply. That's for a maintenance uh, uh, purpose, actually. So that's uh, uh, clarified that that's on page 10. Water scarcity looms, board stops supply. Obi Anon's deputy defects to APC. Abga declares prayers. 4.9 billion Naira fraud. Judge angry as Fanika Obi sons trial for fifth time. Three brothers and two others bombed in Adamawa tanker fire. Not Central Forum makes case to produce Buhari's successor in 2023. Bayon. <laughs> have you finished yes, with uh, we have uh, the leadership? Yes, we have the leadership. Yes, just uh, below the uh, nameplate, we have FG states OPS to fund capital projects with 350 trillion naira in five years. Eleven, one year after NSAS protest, police put drug on reforms. One year after NSAS protest, police put drug on reforms. You find details on page four. Police brutality continues amid attacks on stations, facilities. Over 20 police stations attacked, 47 officers killed in 12 months. Senate accuses seven MDAs of sabotaging PMD's loan request. Senate accuses seven MDAs of sabotaging PMB's loan request. PDP chairman, northern leaders narrow down to Ayu, Shema, and Nazif. You find details on page six. Obaseki meets PMB, seeks funding for ranches. Power shift in new twist, not central bank backs northern governors. And COVID-19 vaccination mandatory for civil servants from December First, these are what we have. Yes, uh, there's a story you read there about police brutality continues amid attacks on stations and I think it should be reversed. Yes, it, it should be brutality yes. on, on police, police stations. Yes, I think yes. that, that, is, that it should be because should be. from the evidence provided mm. there, it says there's an increase on attack on, on attack police stations. On police so stations. it's reversed. I think it's a anyway, typo error. <laughs> be that as it may, uh, three seminarians who were abducted on Monday night mm. have been released. Uh, they were, there were seven of them that were actually uh, abducted. Four are still there. The Chancellor of the Kavachan Diocese, Father Emmanuel Okolo, uh, who gave the information that they have been released, called for prayers uh, for intercession for the rest, four others to be also released. This brings to eight now persons who have been kidnapped from institutions. These four seminarians and four other students of Bethel Baptist. You recall that mm -hmm. the students mm -hmm. from FGC Yauri were released yesterday, and they were supposed to have been taken over to Berenin Kebi uh, yesterday. Meanwhile, the Inspector General of Police has ordered police mobile force commanders to deal decisively with political talks who may want to scuttle the November 6th Anambra uh, governorship election. Inspector General Usman Baba Ali Kali, reading the riot act, said that political talks should be dealt with ruthlessly. He vowed to deal with any commander who is unwilling or shows lack of capacity to key into the new police reform agenda. He was stressing that election security action plan will revolve around mobile police and all units, he charged them to remain apolitical and deal ruthlessly with any violent elements uh, that, will, will, that are, that are ill-guided by, by political talks. He also emphasized that the police will should not be tested because they are set for ens ensure credible free election. Inspector General of Police said discipline, professionalism, and operational excellence in, in the mobile police force is what he set to enforce. He, uh, he charged the ins uh, Assistant Inspector General Police Mobile Force to identify, rationalize, 
and also uh, and get credible elements of the Nuba police force to enforce the new police plan. There's also the arrest by economic and financial crime at Ibadan Zone of 22 suspected internet frosters. The operatives raided the frosters in Ogbomacho. They seized, among other things, five cars, phones, and other laptops. 20 of the suspects have been already indicted and are to be charged to court. It will be recorded that just only last month, 31 were also arrested in Benin, in the Edo State. 13 exotic cars were seized from them. Also, in the, about the same time, 56 were arrested in Ogu. In fact, the three, they were all arrested in three hotels. So, internet frosters are actually on the increase. There's a report that was read that with the effect on 1st of December, any government, federal government worker will be barred from office if he appears unvaccinated. The secretary to the government of the federation and chairman of the presidential steering committee said uh, that he indicated this at the national briefing yesterday. He says from December 1st, 2021, employees of federal government shall be required to show proof of COVID-19 vaccination or present a negative COVID-19 PCR test of three days duration, that is 72 hours, before they can gain access to the office. This will apply to all federal government offices locations in the country, as well as her missions abroad. A service-wide circular is to be issued to guide the process. Boss Mufisafa emphasized that data now show that in the last four weeks, the trend of infection is going down in some states, but sadly, it is also going <coughs> up in other states. The total persons that have been uh, tested so far are 3,141,795. Travel to South Africa, uh, Turkey, and Brazil that were later on pre uh, prescribed has now been lifted. Um, meanwhile, the World Health Organization has also said that the death toll from COVID-19 is now at the lowest ever in the last one year. Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus says that the world the death toll uh, of about 50,000 a week was uh, nevertheless the lowest but unacceptable. He's reported to have said that deaths are declining in every region except in Europe where the countries are facing fresh waves in cases as well as deaths. The director general also lamented over the support, lack of support for developing countries in the way of ensuring equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. He pointed out that other countries are ruling out booster vaccination, and this is contrary to the vaccine distribution population across the world, because he says that many African countries, third world countries, particularly in Africa, uh, not have the opportunity of vaccines, but some <coughs> developed countries are already contemplating <coughs> booster vaccination. Okay. He you know, indicated also. Yeah, bio. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry to uh, jump in here. That's the issue of um, the vaccination, which is still on COVID-19 that you're talking about. Mm. Uh, but the federal government now directing all its employees to show proof of vaccination before being admitted into their workplaces on the 1st of December or otherwise uh, present the negative test result. Of three days duration. Of three days. Well, which means that every other four days you have to go for a test. If it is three days, it means that after three days it, it expires. So, and then who bears who bears the cost? Uh, the, the, uh, the the idea behind getting persons to uh, vaccinate is a good one, but th this is almost now like mandatory vaccination. Uh, when the government was responding to the pandemic last year, if you recall, officers on grade levels uh, two to twelve, because there's no grade level one effectively. <coughs> Excuse me. Were uh, required to work from home, and this lingered for a very long time. They all, those workers didn't protest at the time, because the government said they did that to protect them and then protect others. Now the government is saying for us to continue to protect ourselves and our gain much wider herd immunity, uh, we will require you to get vaccinated before you can come into uh, the, the workplace. This has created quite uh, some tension in some other jurisdictions, particularly the United States, uh, where. Uh, state, some state governments, Texas as an example, uh, have issued counter directives against mandatory vaccination. Uh, others, of course, uh, New York is insisting 
on, uh, on mandatory vaccination to get into schools and uh, other public places. My concern with uh, this policy, uh, this directive is uh, how to ensure that you can enforce it. Now, federal government employees have a lead time of about seven weeks. It's about seven weeks from now to the first of December. So, uh, how many vaccine doses do we have available right now? And how many vaccination locations are available? Locations are available. And how many of them can take the uh, double jab uh, before the December 1st? Or is it a single shot you take and there you go? Then what is the proof that you have? Is the green vaccination card that you and I uh, collected, uh, passport uh, is not engraved on it. So suppose, uh, I'm not saying you will do, but suppose uh, I give mine to Juma, so Juma is going to say, where is your vaccination card? Just you flash it and then you go. Uh, and then you say, federal government employees. Well, uh, that's quite a sizable number. Is it only civil servants? Or are we talking about public servants? By the time you include MBAs and, and so on and so forth, uh, it there, will be, there will be quite an issue. And of course, they are all over the country. If you say federal secretariat to the states, uh, who is going to enforce? So these are some of the idea is good, but enforceability so that it doesn't then become a joke. People will, uh, people will just say, yeah, disregard it. That directive was issued in Abuja. Sorry. In fact, when you talk about federal civil service, um, they are now equated all as public officers. Whether you work in the civil service or in the, the, the ministries, department, and agencies uh, that were formerly referred to as public officer, they are all now lumped together. So when the, a directive comes like that, it cuts across everybody, whether you are in the conventional civil service or the uh, agencies and departments. Enforceability is a big problem. There are two governors who visited the president yesterday. They include governor of a state governor of Basaki, and he said four issues were raised with the president. He apprised the president on the debts owed by the federal agencies in Edo state, and he was seeking intervention for payment. He also talked, thanked the president for if, uh, initiatives to return artifacts that were stolen all over the world uh, from Nigeria, and he said they should be brought back. And when they are brought back, they should be domiciled from the place they were taken from, that is in Benin. The third, one of the critical areas he harped on was on anti-grazing law, which he says a uh, state has not passed because it wants to make sure that it can enforce that law. He says that the Edo people resolve that ranching is expensive and a private business. And therefore, federal government should be able to uh, fund, make available funds for persons or individuals under the National Livestock Transformation Program if they want to go into the business. After consultation with Edo people, he says, it was agreed that the federal government should help people benefit from funding to go into ranching and livestock uh, program. He also said that he could not abandon the People's Democratic Party that gave him uh, a, a cover where he was pushed out of APC. He also uh, lauded the initiative about electronic transmission of election results. Governor Uzo Dimma was also at the presidency and he hinted the possibility of talks to find out uh, uh, was the secessionist as a solution to insecurity in his state. He well, made uh, we're really, really running out of time. <laughs> it's almost 8 o'clock now. We're yes. really running out of time. Really? We have to thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for coming. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not yet a Juma, so that uh, <laughs> our, our viewers don't get misled. <laughs> <laughs> it's going yeah, to be right 8 o'clock. It's right about so 23 minutes. Uh, exactly. 20 minutes to eight. Juma, right. thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate you as always. So you're watching Good Morning Nigeria. We'll take a break now. When we return, our conversation will begin. Don't go away. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. Now, before we commence our conversation on uh, non-oil taxes in the country, let's uh, listen into this background that I've put together by our correspondent, Joseph Watson. Since the oil boom in the 1970s, Nigeria's economic growth to date has depended mainly on revenue from crude oil. However, continuous global drop in the price of crude oil in recent times has taken a heavy toll on the nation's economy as government at all levels are struggling to provide democratic dividends. For quite some time now, the country's budget is being financed with borrowed funds despite its vast human and natural resources. To increase the nation's revenue, the present administration has encouraged diversification of the economy 
by exploring other sectors to support development projects. One vital source the country wants to enhance to generate additional revenue is taxation. Sadly, Nigeria's tax system has not lived up to expectation, with experts pointing to structural and administrative defects. The most reliable taxpayers in the country are in the public sector, while many in the private sector work free. Big investors and powerful politicians feel above the law to pay taxes, and many officers are accused of colluding with evaders. In many state governors employ touts as officers who rather help themselves with whatever they collect to better their personal lives. The number of billionaires in Lagos alone are more than the, number, the total number of billionaires in the whole of South Africa. Yet, what we generate as personal income tax, as at the JTV level, or by Lagos state government, was just less than 400 billion. The result is inadequate fund to improve infrastructure development, healthcare services, and food production among others, for the well-being of citizens. A lot of people that are supposed to be paying their taxes, they don't. And you expect the government to handle everything. Even as the nation's resources are domiciled in states, month after month, governors look up to the federal locations to run government. Now, what are the factors affecting exploration of the tax economy? Is the tax regulation system at fault? And how important is expanding Nigeria's tax base? Guests on Good Morning Nigeria will extract the nation's tax system and speak on how to explore the non-oil tax in a short while. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph Hudson, for that background. We have uh, guests with us here in the Abuja studios, as well as at our Lagos Network Center for this conversation. Let's first go over to Lagos and introduce uh, Hile Adetola Abangbe. Uh, she's a fiscal policy expert and uh, non-executive board member of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Uh, Hile Abangbe, a pleasure to have you with us on Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you, Slim. My pleasure to be here as well. Thank you. All right, uh, also here with us uh, in the studios, right in Abuja, would like to uh, welcome Sunde Okewo, the Acting Director of the Special Tax Audit Department of the uh, Federal Inland Revenue Service. Okewo, pleasure to have you this morning. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Good morning, Nigeria. And we also have joining us here in our Abuja studio, May Nasara Kogo Umero a lawyer and international affairs analyst who is a regular on the program. You're welcome. It's always my honor to be here for Nation Building. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, well, let's uh, uh, start the conversation uh, with uh, Ile Abangbe in uh, Lagos Network Center. We, we had always, as a country, uh, talked about the need to diversify the economy and invariably also diversify our revenue sources. But increasingly, uh, that need has become more urgent on account of uh, what happens on the international arena, plus the uh, various needs that uh, we have to address back home. You just give us a sense of what is it that we are missing uh, in not exploring uh, other sources of revenue other than oil. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Nigeria. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Nigeria. I would like to start by I'd like to start by saying like really that the Nigerian economy, you know, like the Honorable Minister for Finance, Budgets and National Planning, did tell us in a budget address that the economy is fairly diversified, and what we really do lack and what we really do have is a really a revenue challenge. And if you look at where we are as a country today whether you're looking at um, the current budget proposal, which um, gives us a deficit of about six trillion, what then that tells us is we really need to close the gap from a revenue perspective. But because of the way we're structured as a nation and our fiscal federalism, taxes are sort of at different levels and different categories. So you have the federal government being responsible for certain categories of taxes, you have the state government being responsible for certain categories of taxes, and then you then have the local government authorities as well being responsible for categories of taxes. So with that, what then happens is every tier of government needs to bring its fair share 
into the pot to ensure that the pot is big enough for everyone to share. And that really is where the crunch and the debate has always been. How much are we getting, whether it's from the state and from the local government and also from the federal government? Are we as a nation getting the fair share from all three tiers of government? And what can we do to better ensure that we get more taxes and more revenue in, whether they are levies or taxes um, from each, each tiers of government? Secondly, is then asking ourselves, are there loopholes? Are there avenues where we can plug gaps? Those gaps, what are we going to do? What are we doing about them? One of the ones I, I, I thought to talk about really today is looking at how do we re-strategize our economy better, you know, from a, from a state and local government perspective. So when you look at every other fiscal federalism in the world, you know, whether it's provincial, things like corporate property taxes, things like personal income taxes, they are the focus of those federations, of those, um, of those, of those um, provincial authorities. And it's, not, it's the same in Nigeria. The data we have from last year tells us that all 36 states of the federation gave about 1.5 trillion naira of IGR, you know, as IGR. That is 10% of what South Africa gave to just from personal income tax alone. And the South Africa population is less than, um, it's about 40 million people. And we have how many million, how, how, many, how many million, we have about 200 million people, you know, within our tax net. So it's looking at all those other untapped areas within our federalism, whether it's at the state level and at the, at, at the local government level, and plugging them and ensuring everybody contributes something into the coffers of government. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ohile Ehile, for your opening comments there. Let me now join Mr. Sunday Okeu, Federal Internal Revenue Service here in Abuja. A diversification, they say, is key to the development of any country. And according to the chairman of the Federal Internal Revenue, he says it is work in progress. Let's have your comment on how do we begin to re-strategize collection of uh, tax to enhance growth and um, how do we adopt a tax system directed at promoting economic development in Nigeria? Okay, thank you very well, uh, very much for the, 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 those two wonderful questions. Um, diversification has been in the news for quite some wh a while in Nigeria. And uh, it's a work in progress as said by the executive chairman because we cannot be said to have fully diversified. Yes. As a revenue administration, we are exploring options and looking at, looking at our processes, improving on our processes to ensure that tax collection from the non-oil is increasing. And the good news is that even though we are not yet there, but the tax oil, the, 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 the non-tax oil, non-tax, uh, non-oil collection rather, is on the increase. Before now, the oil tax collection is usually around 60-70% of the collection of FRS. But the last quarter, up to September, yes, up to September this year, our collection from non-oil is about 77% as against what it used to be before. Meaning that the remaining 22-23% is what came from oil sector taxes. So that is one thing that the FRS is doing in terms of diversification of the uh, sources of tax revenue generation that in the country. And even we are looking at our processes to make sure that our officers are more equipped, equipped in terms of knowledge, technical competence, equipped in terms of resources for which they are, they, they are required to do the work we are also better administ administrations now than before because we are customer centric. We value our customers, we engage them, we ensure that we are closer to them and ensure that whenever they have a need, they are sensitive, we meet such needs, especially those who are from the non-oil sector. Like the background has said, and like uh, my board member who spoke earlier also said, you know, over time, we are a nation that has depended so much on the oil revenue. And economists have described Nigeria as a mono economy. 
we all know the challenges and the problems around that. When the oil prices must dive, our revenue responds in the same direction instantaneously. And that will lead us to the point of going to look for money to fund the national budget. So as a service, <coughs> our core responsibility is to fund the national budget. And we have to do this in partnership with the other states. Because one thing I need to stress further is that when we talk taxation in Nigeria, not only the FRS, but we are at the center, we are taking the lead. So we are to fund the national budget. He, this ago, the, Mr. the president presented about 16.39 trillion budget. It will be so wonderful if we can fund 100% of that internally. It will be too wonderful. That means that we will not need to go out to look for external funding. So all of this, the service that is the FRS is doing, trying to uh, modernize our processes, leveraging on infrastructure, leveraging on technology, and so on and so forth. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Sunday. Okay, well, let's bring in our and Sarah uh, Umar. Well, the, the whole idea of the, the challenge in ramping up non-oil uh, uh, revenue by way of, 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 of taxes, uh, is it a matter that we have sufficiently focused on or we've also been politicking with it? Well, no, it's a, it's a product of a consistent neglect over a long period of time. Uh, no <coughs> developmental stride of any nation can go better than its planner. And you cannot plan successfully where you don't tally it with fiscal discipline. What I'm talking about here is that here we are, we have the mechanism for general tax administration. But when you have a legal lacuna, when you have a gap, you are creating unexpected kind of problems that will be very difficult for you to surmount. When you take the tax matters in the Constitution, uh, clearly they fall under items 58 and 59 of the exclusive list. Now under that, there is no clear definition regarding who is to collect what tax. And as a result of which you will end up bringing about uh, uh, confusion uh, among the tiers of the government, uh, the federal government, the state government, and the local government. And apart from that, any tax administration that you want to avoid in any country, you must do it in tandem with Section 16 of the Constitution, talking about the economic objective of the country. The economic objective talks about the need to develop the citizenry, the need to develop the nation, not just relying on tax for the governance randomly. Now, I'm talking about this in the context of planning. It is not so much the best thing for you to be projecting this is the tax quantum we want to have. At the end of the year, you talk about tax deficit, you talk about tax uh, non-remittance, you talk about these things, but you should be able to plan it in tandem with the practical reality of what is available. Nigeria, over the years, has been neglecting knowing all sector. Now we are in a dilemma. Generally, globally speaking, the world is in economic recession. Apart from the world being in economic recession, we are finding it very, very difficult to raise the price of our own oil that we are expecting. We are not the ones to raise the price. And apart from that, we have a lot of security and other challenges that are hampering optimum production of even the oil to warrant us export it out. Now, what is the way out? The way out is for us to look into other sources of revenue. Uh, other sources of revenue, glad the federal era revenues uh, in the first and second quarter released that 77% uh, of the revenue we got generated is not from the oil. About 22 only is from the oil. So by virtue of that, it's clearly a signal that we have to go back to the drawing board to plan. Uh, we have to plan. We have a lot of untapped resources, especially when you talk about solid minerals, when you talk about agriculture, when you talk about consumption of goods and services. We have avalanche of laws within the country, but without this, it is important for us to have harmonization of all these laws so that at the end of it, 
we will be able to have the federal, the state, the local government, and even the private sector talking at par in the interest of the nation's development in tandem with Section 16 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Take, for example, the VAT Act. The VAT Act, when we talk about it, Section 2, Section 7, Section 42, clearly talks about a lot of articles there, uh, especially when we talk about Section 40 of the VAT Act of 1991, and 1993, but clearly, clearly it creates a window of confusion when there is no clearly definition of who is to collect which tax, when and where. And that is the reason why you are having collusion with some state governors. They are saying, no, we are the ones responsible for this. No, they have to res re resort into going to the courts. Had it been we have all these things assembled, the National Assembly should, as a matter of urgency, address these issues. The lacuna we have in the Constitution can easily be resolved by making amendment in our le legal mechanism. By the time that one is done, it's not healthy to be seeing state government and the federal government modeling, flexing their models at the level of the courtroom. It is not, e it is not good. We should have a, a, a decorum and cooperation so that the interest of the nation will transcend over and above any other consideration, uh, bearing in mind that uh, the fiscal federalism people are just uh, trying to reincarnate uh, it's, it's seemingly difficult under 1999 constitution. People are still with the Yotropia of 1960 and 1963 constitutions that talks about fiscal federalism whereby all sources of revenue will be under the preserve of the states and then they give a residue to the federation. The 1999 constitution is diametrically opposite of that in that greater of the revenues are at the control of the federation and periodically there are revenue mobilization allocation and fiscal commission and then revenue sharing formula committee meetings by the federal government under sections 153 take one of the constitution whereby the governors will now meet periodically to be reviewing what will be the sharing formula of which revenue and from which source by the time the national economic council you know takes this into the level of the seriousness it deserves sit with the governors within one group and then discuss in the put the interest of the nation over and above any other interest. All these things will be strengthened and then the interest of the nation will supersede over and above any other interest. The important thing is stability for the nation, development for the nation. These are the important things we need, but we must do them in tandem with planning. If we don't plan very well, then we are really allowing things to go under the canopy of our magic. We have to plan, yes, this is our capacity. We have a lot of untapped resources, about 148 non-oil uh, uh, resources buried in the land. The government should turn attention towards uh, uh, extraction of those type of resources, set up refineries, diversify the refineries, setting up not just petroleum refineries. We should have refineries for solid minerals that will be able to go about extraction, that will be able to link up with the international market so that we will be able to get optimum revenue that we need to meet the exigencies of the daily challenges we are facing as a nation. Hmm. That's quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, also, I'm sure everybody listening at home will understand the breakdown you've be given. Yes. I, I'm going to stay with you for a bit, yes. you know. Let's take a te step back mm. before ni uh, colonialists came to Nigeria. Yes. The traditional institutions depended largely on tax collection. Yes. They had a system. When they, when they came, there was a system of mm. government already in operation mm. in Nigeria before the colonialists came. Yes. What changed? Yes. We the got laws, have they been, are yeah, they new laws? It was so easy to collect tax then, mm, mm, but mm. what changed now? Three, three, three different uh, problems emanated that led us into this quagmire. The first one is that the system of the colonialists was that they engaged the people. Uh, people are the primary bribe of uh, governors. They engage the people. People really feel that they are custodians of the governance. It is for them. So as a result of which people were enthusiastic to contribute. I remember in 1967 when uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth visited Nigeria, uh, all the regions got about blueprints, economic blueprint, whereby they will check their respective regions uh, to, to, to break up pro pro progressive. The Queen postulated that by 1980 she is seeing the possibility of this potential, uh, uh, I mean, imagine uh, uh, a country that was about to be given independence day, that by 1980 it will be ranked among the superpowers based on the potentiality of the resources already uh, 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 produced, based on the developmental plans. 
Then we got another boost in 1959 with the discovery of oil. With the discovery of oil, the, the greater number of those governing the country decided to jettison the plants because the original plants were based on uh, other natural resources, agriculture, solid minerals, commerce, trade, uh, uh, international uh, 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 business of artifacts and other things uh, uh, that were having. For example, Benin's Benin, Benin Kingdom, for example, 200 to 300 years before independence was already an international uh, 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 landscape when you talk about economic uh, progression of the world as a whole, not just Nigeria. So when we got the, 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 the boost in the oil and then we started, uh, uh, Abu Shafa Abele was the first prime minister then, we, I mean, uh, uh, petroleum resources minister, we started getting huge money. Suddenly, young people came 1966, uh, after 1966, the coup, precisely from 1970, young people came that were not privy to that original plan. Uh, General Gawan's time came, and uh, soon thereafter, they jettisoned the originality of the historical plan, and then to such an extent, we were pronouncing that our problem was not generation of the money, was not generation of the revenue, but how rather to how it. to spend it, how to spend it, you see. And then we went about uh, 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 in 1976, with the local government reforms, we said, okay, we get some with the traditional institutions, we get some with these things, we evolved the uh, local government system, and 1978-79, uh, we started evolution, political programs, as a result of which we ended up having more or less system of depending on getting allocation monthly, rather than striving to extract from your own source to feed off the bigger pot that is called the Federation uh, uh, Treasury. So everybody now relies now on where uh, at a particular time I will go to Abuja and get my own chair instead of thinking of how to contribute. And then to add worse into uh, the situation, uh, when President Buhari came into power in 19, uh, uh, 2015, you discovered that a greater number of the states were in huge indebtedness. A huge indebtedness instead of allowing them to strive and navigate themselves out of the murky waters. And then the president now decided to be giving them bailout funds. Mm -hmm. Bailout money, Paris club came, we started sharing. Instead of clearly sitting the, with the, at the level of the economic council, where all the governors will be there, the president will be there, to see how we can utilize those money in bringing out new frontiers of revenue generation. We now decided to be giving them even in trenches. And at the end of it, some of them even decided to even, uh, instead of appreciating the gesture of the federal government, decided to take the federal government to court that we needed more as oliver trees. We needed more. As a result of which now a culture entrenched whereby the federal and the local government system decided to abdicate on ex ex extraction of other revenue. They are rather than they, they now relax waiting for federal government to be creating the magic of getting them whatever uh, is their uh, 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 residue under the federal arrangement uh, as their own uh, share of the federation, federation share. So, so long we don't think of revenue generation from the angle of responsibility as a leader for you to extract the means with which you will govern. So long you will be waiting for money just to come on that. We have advocated on so many sources, traditional sources of revenue generation. We are rather waiting at the end of it for revenue allocation to be coming just like that to the, to, to the disregard of the more greater quantum of money that we are having buried on the land, buried in our skills, buried in our own uh, 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 architecture of living. So we have to look beyond uh, governance and uh, at the state, at the local government level to really be educated to go beyond reliance on paltry collection mm -hmm. of uh, allocation. And the federal architecture too should think of at the level of uh, National Co Economic Council calling all the stakeholders, the federal, the state governments, uh, the, the state governments and the local governments, calling them so that those areas of controversies will be resolved by making simple legislation. Where you got the problem is the lacuna in the Constitution of 1999, where it did not clearly say who is responsible for what. Uh, you make avalanche of provisions that, yes, these are articles under which you will be able to tax the citizenry, you will be able to tax multinational corporations, you will be able to tax uh, local uh, industrial corporations, you will be able to tax this without clearly talking about who is responsible for that. And then the federal government too should give up and then talk about uh, fiscal discipline. In a situation whereby there is target for a agency to be able to bring into the uh, uh, treasury, so, 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 
quantum of money, and you discover that less than that is actually generated, or even if it's generated optimally, a very little fraction of that is in actual sense coming into the federation coffers. Questions will be asked on that rather than waiting for the next uh, uh, fiscal year to expect them to perform another magic. By the time you now entrench the culture of non-penality on every misdeed or on every uh, deficit or performance, then you are encouraging the, 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 the status quo tradition of uh, non-compliance with your directive to continue. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going back uh, to our Lagos Network studio. Uh, yeah, Lagos is off. Lagos is off in the meantime. The studio, yeah. All right. Uh, uh, we, um, once our engineers saw that out, we'll get uh, a new guest to join uh, uh, Mr. Baimbe there in Lagos. So back to uh, Sunday Okewu, who is the acting director, uh, special tax of the Department of FIRS. L let's clarify something, because we we'll keep talking about, uh, when you were speaking about that, you were talking about collections by FRS and then the need to satisfy the budgetary uh, demands that, that we have. But I I the, the federation that we have is such that subnational entities also have their own budgets. And they will also have to fund these budgets. Just as we have seen a rise in efficiency in FRS, a number of uh, states, if not all the states, now have their internal revenue services uh, reformed over the, o over the years. But still, we are having this yearning shortfall in non-oil tax revenue. What is responsible for this? Is it inefficiency in collection, inefficiency in properly mapping, or just what is wrong? All right, thank you. Um, what is wrong with low non-oil tax collection. To me, the number one thing is we have a very poor tax culture. And that is, that was the question that was asked, one of the questions that was asked my co-speaker. The tax culture of Nigerians very low. How did we get there? It has been a question, a question that I also asked myself. I was told that before the Europeans, before the report were colonized, that people do pay tributes to their kings and emirs and what have you. So indirectly, before the, we were colonized, there was a task culture. But in modern days, it could be because of the discovery of oil that we have gone to the last, like he said, so over time, an average Nigerian on the street believed that Nigeria is a rich country. And of course, we are rich. We have the potentials to be rich. So until we change that culture, that attitude, that people believe that they need to pay their taxes as and when due, accurately and correctly, that is the number one factor that must be addressed. I'm just wondering, uh, Mr. Okay, well, uh, I think it would be unfair to Nigerians to say that we have a poor, now we have a poor tax culture, which is correct. Uh, but even after the colonial authorities uh, arrived and seized the, the various instruments of governance, Nigerians were still paying taxes. I would imagine that up to the 70s and 80s, Nigerians were still paying taxes. Indeed, it wasn't until 1973 when oil prices shot up. Oil wasn't a significant contributor to uh, Nigeria's uh, uh, revenue profile. I, I, on Good Morning Nigeria, we have had calls to point out uh, one or two things. You say, okay, well, I, I, I don't know whether you, you know, bicycles in those days used to have uh, licenses. Sure. Uh, revenue calls. Dogs, if they had to have a license on their collar. Mm -hmm. And adults, uh, you and I, we couldn't, uh, I mean, the, the revenue collector in our community would know us. You say you couldn't have a uh, productive adult who would not pay tax. Uh, I mean, I did, I sat right here sometime in the past, even during the military regime, when the Bermuda was military governor of, uh, of, the, of the Midwest. Uh, it, it, they, they had these combi buses pay now, inscribed pay now. 
if some adults saw that mobile, uh, combi bus parked somewhere and they didn't have, they knew that they had not paid their taxes, you will see them take it to their heels. This was imbecility. But anyhow, we will see. But it's a point that you have noted that uh, oil has tended to decloud uh, uh, tax obligations as individuals. Now, yes. back to Lagos, I, I want to respond. Just yeah, one. Yes, I, I, may, I may just say this quickly that, yes. yeah, even though in those, t those period that you have mentioned, people were paying all of those taxes, I recall that then in the village square, there will be people who will be arrested because they have yet to pay their taxes. Exactly. So all of those, it's not as if those enforcement activities are also not ongoing. But when I, what I meant by poor culture is that when you, when, you, when you take the size of taxpayers relative to the population of Nigeria, now, now hmm. it is too low. It Fine. Too low. That, that's one point that I think we have to explore because it has to do, let's just say, for instance, personal income tax, uh, which is you know, a very critical component plus others. But let's go back to our Lagos Network Center. Uh, engineers have cleared up the connection issues. We have a new guest joining us there. It's uh, Taiwo Oyedele. Uh, Taiwo Oyedele is a uh, fiscal policy partner. All right, you see him there on the screen. He's a fiscal policy partner and Africa tax leader at Price uh, Waterhouse uh, Coopers. Uh, Mr. Taiwo Oyedele, pleasure to have you with us on the program this morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning, Nigerians. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, tell us something uh, from your experience. Uh, have we just been paying lip service to non-oil taxes? Thank you very much. I think, you know, I found the... Uh, you can see the uh, indication there. Uh, signal is... Uh, is poor. Um, all right. So wh again, why that has been sorted out? Let's come back uh, to, uh, to to the studios here. M Mena Sarah, uh, when you were talking, you raised a number of of, of legal constitutional issues and uh, the whole idea of federalism and what the challenges just might be. By the time we drill down into uh, some of those aspects, we just might miss it. I'm just wondering. Some persons have argued that. It is not so much the question because the taxing powers and collection powers are also, again, fairly obvious. Mm. But it is the efficiency. It is the efficiency. You know, the taxing powers would be who has the authority to impose taxes. Uh, and uh, the statute would provide a guidance. Yes. Corporate income tax, for instance. Yes. It's a function of, of the federation. Mm. In this case, the National Assembly. Mm. Uh, and so on and so forth. And the percentage but efficiency in collection then becomes a, a, a matter that is distributed amongst the three tiers of government. So, but why is it that over time uh, and now still uh, we are not having sufficient ratings from our non-revenue, uh, uh, non-oil revenue uh, sources? Well, simply because we look at it from the angle of gear, not from the angle of service. And that is the reason why you will see a lot of uh, tax generating agencies, they will be even using consultants, which is wrong. Uh, they will be using consultants, which is an indirect way of abdicating from their responsibilities. Uh, like we said in the traditional uh, days, th then even cattle were being taxed. Uh, there will be taxes for cattle, for goats, for everything. And then uh, per household, there used to be uh, uh, this thing. We, we, we used to know that one. And then markets, uh, too, when you bring uh, goods and services, there will be these things. But uh, that time, the officials go to the field. But now the officials will rest in their air-conditioned office and then will be approving for consultants to go there and be generating and be creating the magic for them so that at the end they will be the ones to be praised by the government that they have done so, 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 so quantum of tax generation. So that is it. Secondly, uh, there is a disconnect uh, between the procedure or the system of tax collection and the reality of the engagement of the citizens. Uh, section 414 of section 1 of the Constitution talks about the citizens as the owners of the sovereignty of the federation. In other words, democracy is all about the people. Now, in a situation whereby you are taking it as an elitist kind of uh, uh, phenomenon, 
uh, you are concentrating tax affairs only in the federal capitals in the cities. Who knows about taxation now in my village? Who knows about taxation? You are not going to the hinterland when it comes to the issue of taxation. You are restricting it only within the city centers. The tax officers don't want to go to the hinterland, don't want to go to the villages. In those days, uh, the jungle tax, the cattle tax, the taxes for ceremonies and the rest, you will see the tax officers going to the villages there. They, and they, by going there, they are having direct uh, 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 communication with the citizenry, by virtue of which there will be input and output theory being practicalized. They will be able to know, appreciate uh, what are the needs of the people. In those days, we use this tax mechanism to even go about vaccinations uh, in, in those days. For example, vaccinations uh, against SA fly uh, to the animals and the race. Uh, the, 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 the this and the owners of the animal will be enthusiastic to pay because at the end they know that these vaccinations will be for the improved benefit of the health care of their own cattle of their own uh, livestock at the end of it. So apart from that too, uh, the people normally, there they, they, they used to be wide uh, uh, education. There will be education, sensitization, there will be this thing we used to call majiji. There will be these things, there will be billboards, hand bills and the rest, talking about it is with this money of the tax, we will be able to bring portable water to your communities. Now, how many local government headquarters have even portable water in the country? How many local government headquarters have standard health care facilities? So you should be able to educate the citizenry, yes, this will be the end product of what you are giving as a tax. You are contributing, you are partaking in the governance. Partaking in the governance means you contribute something, and when you contribute something, you have the moral booster to ask questions regarding the quality of the governance that is being dispensed to you. So this is the, 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 the missing gap. And apart from that, too, uh, 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 in, in those days during uh, tax forest, there used to be tax conferences. Uh, when you go there, people of the town will be gathered. You now educate them. You tell the government has sent us. An ordinary person from the village think government is somebody that is an, uh, a big person from somewhere that is a VC. Government is coming to assist. You go with uh, uh, incentives, whether it's seedlings, whether it's whatever. But those small, small things you are giving them, you are encouraging them to show them, yes, they are accountable. I mean, the government is aware of their living. The government is aware of them. But nowadays, it is all restricted to uh, state capitals. In most cases, you hardly see tax collection at the level of the local government, talk less of remote villages. So people, because of the uh, this thing, uh, erroneous uh, dependency <coughs> on federal allocation of money. Uh, they are now relying on that only where there is insufficiency, government will rush into borrowing. Uh, we will borrow, we will borrow rather than opening new frontiers of tax generation to fill up the gaps. And rather than adjusting to your own expenditure to other government, to do it in tandem with the practical reality of what you can extract from the nation. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mena mm. uh, We understand that uh, we can return to Lagos. Uh, Taiwo Yodele and uh, Mr. Abani, but well, we so apologize for the connection glitches that we are having this morning. But uh, Taiwo Yodele, I pose the question to you as to whether we have been uh, paying lip service, as it were, to uh, driving up our non-oil tax revenue. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, a multifaceted issue uh, that we are facing as a country uh, when, we, when it comes to non-oil as well as non-oil taxation. And I think the reason for this, um, you know, maybe it's not too difficult to identify so many Nigerians indeed are paying taxes, uh, but many of them are not paying the taxes to government. So in other words, they're paying informal taxes to non-state actors, and they're paying implicit taxes by taking care of themselves in areas where government should have come in to provide social services. The Nigerian Economic Summit Group uh, conducted a study uh, at about 2018-2019 on tax morale. And we found out, this was across the whole country, we found out that uh, Nigerians' tax morale is one of the lowest in the world. Uh, nearly 83% of Nigerians don't see anything wrong with tax evasion. This is explaining it to them in very simple terms. And they still thought it was okay to evade your taxes. 
only 17% of Nigerians thought it was okay to pay the tax that you need to pay and that you should be punished when you don't pay. Interestingly, we then asked them why. And the number one reason is that they, they do not trust government. Uh, number two reason is they do not get social exchange. So even the money they are paying, they feel they are not getting anything in return for that. And you would agree with me that it's, it's extremely difficult, even if you are the tax officer, it's very difficult to keep paying taxes when you don't feel that you are getting something in return for the money that you pay. This is further compounded by the fact that even the little taxes we are collecting is being paid by the people at the bottom of the ladder. So you find a lot of the middle class, a lot of the upper class, and a lot of wealthy people are not paying. Uh, South African Revenue Service have just released their report for last year, last fiscal year, and they collected about 37 trillion naira. I just can't get my head around it. 37 trillion naira. This is a country really of you know, less than one third of our population. Interestingly, personal income tax alone from that amount was about 14 trillion naira. Again, this is a country where they have exempted people who earn up to about 300,000 naira per month don't pay personal income tax. Yet, they collected more in personal income tax in a pandemic when their economy actually contracted by about 6% or even more. They still collected personal income tax alone. That is more than all the taxes collected in Nigeria by FRS, all 36 states, all 774 local government. So we have to really think about our economy and, and the way we run this government to make sure that everybody plays a part and making sure that the burden of taxation falls on the right people with the ability to pay. And it comes to the point of using technology and data and intelligence to ensure that uh, you know, when people buy vehicles, they buy land, they travel abroad, you know, they do importation, feel free to do all your activities. But we need to be able to track that, connect the dots, and ensure that you're paying your fair share of taxes uh, to government. And of course, when the money gets to government, we also need to track that the money is being used for the purpose of the people. I think the worst level of government in Nigeria with this is the local government. You can't even find their budget. You can't find their account. Nobody seems to know what they are doing. In that study we conducted, we found out that many of the officers at the local government level don't even know how much they have collected. And in some of the local government, we found out that the amount that is officially collected can't even pay the salaries of the tax officers, not the workers of the local government, just the tax officers alone. And it's not that they are not collecting the taxes, a lot of it is going into private pockets. So we really need to deal with these issues. Uh, government also sometimes, their focus can be very complicated and confusing. If you ask all agencies to start raising revenue, that for me is counterproductive. Agencies of government should focus on rendering services to the people, ensuring that you facilitate business activities and support economic growth and leave the, the work of revenue generation to the revenue agency. That's why you have FRS. That's why you have the state internal revenue service at the state level. We shouldn't have to duplicate all these agencies. The more we do that, the less efficient we are at collecting taxes, the higher the cost of collection, the higher the leakages and waste, and then the less uh, you know Nigerians are willing to pay their taxes. And I think ultimately, even though I do agree that to a large extent our economy is diversified in terms of non-oil, but I don't think that the economy is productively diversified. So if you think about the largest sector in Nigeria is agriculture. So what are we doing? Oh, mostly primary and basic produce. So we're not adding a lot of value. How much money can you get from the agri-sector today in mm -hmm. terms of taxes? Maybe their tax contribution is even negative because they get more incentive than what we can collect from them. Go to other countries and you find that the agri-sector is contributing significantly uh, to the tax revenue of the country. So we have to think about how do we make our economy not only diversified in terms of calculating the percentage of GDP, but to make it productively diversify, let's aid and support businesses, small ones, medium size, large firms, multinationals, local companies. Let's support businesses to grow. And then that way we have a way, uh, we have something to tax because at the end of the day, tax is really how government shares in the prosperity of people as well as businesses.
if you take VAT for example, uh, our VAT collection is uh, you know with a lot of effort by the FRS is now you know getting close to about two trillion naira in a year. But even at that, if you look at um, you know uh, at Nigeria's GDP, well over one hundred and fifty trillion naira. If we even assume that forty percent of that, which is which tends to be the range around the world between thirty to forty percent, represent exempt items like you know food items and the rest of it. If you tax the remaining sixty percent of our GDP at seven point five percent, as we speak today, we should be raising about five trillion naira. South Africa raised about fourteen trillion naira last year just from VAT alone. Uh, even if you say their rate is higher than us and you divide it by two, then we should be raising seven trillion naira. We are not even anywhere close to that. The state all combined can't even raise one trillion naira from personal income tax. South Africa is doing 14 trillion. So at the end of the day, some of these questions, even around fiscal federalism, in my view, it's not about giving more or less to any level of government. It's about finding out are we optimizing what we currently have and what can we show to the people as the returns for their contribution to government in the form of tax payments. Okay, Mr. Taiwo Oyedele, thank you so much for your opening comments there. You came in late, but you've given quite a huge contribution to the conversation. Before we go on the break, let's join uh, Ehile still in Lagos. You know, a lot of key issues have been raised and um, that must be considered so that we can have an efficient and effective tax rule in our society but is the society ready to change do you think so much um the answer is yes and and when i was listening to malam umar it was quite clear that nigerians will pay their fair share once they can see that the work is being done by the government i mean like taiwo was talking about as well how are we ensuring that we are tying back what we're paying into the services we're providing so that brings up all the conversation around open government partnership. So if I look, for example, if I look at my own life or if I even look at my own um, little cocoon and little world, I would ask myself, you know, if, you, if, if, if in this country, for example, you would know, even in some states, in some local governments, the day salaries are paid because there will be activities within that state, there will be activities within the borders of that state clearly showing you that monies have come into that economy. So what that means is that Nigerians will willingly pay their fair share if they know that, oh, I don't have to worry about my health care. I don't have to worry about education for my children. My roads will be fixed. But that being said, regardless, taxes are mandatory. They are some form of le levy that we pay for living in a civil society. So whether, you know, but the conversation has to keep going, we need to keep having that conversation. Government needs to tie back taxes to services, whether it be it at the federal, at the local, or at the state levels. We must be able to say, oh, this is what I'm using your tax revenue for. We must hold governments very accountable. And I think that's one of the biggest um, issues. Lagos is, is the network is still getting bad here. We'll take a break. What will it turn? We hope the network will be back. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria, and we're discussing no, the non oil sector revenue generation. We'll be right back. <laughs> to lead a program to build what we think will be an acceptable and hopefully affordable housing type based on surveys we did in 2015, 2016 and construction that started in 2017. And that's going on in 34 states as the National Housing Program. This message is from the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. A new edition of TV Guide is out exclusively with Governor Simon Lalong of Plateau State. Since assuming office, our rescue administration has pursued the path of peace and reconciliation and restored confidence among people of different ethnic, religious, and political persuasions. 
This is back on the plateau. We are building world-class infrastructure in roads and opening up opportunities for innovation. The edition is a compendium of mind-blowing stories for your reading pleasure, ranging from entertainment, economy, sports, media, politics, family, and lots more. Pick up a copy and keep abreast with issues and trending features within our space. TV Guide, very incisive, very educative, and comprehensive. Grab a copy at the vendor near you or any NTA station nationwide. TV Guide, your indispensable companion. Dear compatriots, our country can be as great as we want. Let us all commit ourselves to greatness. We must be willing to set aside our differences, unite and stay as one. In our expansive landmass, human and material resources, and plurality lies our strength. Let our challenges lead us to discover our common ground and together let's find solutions. This will take some time so it requires patience, tolerance and forgiveness from every one of us. Let all hands come on deck to protect and transform our country. Let us unite and see each other not as adversaries but as brothers and sisters. Together we can build a better Nigeria for ourselves and for the next generations. This message is brought to you by the National Orientation Agency, NOA, with support from Nigerian Television Authority, NTA. Manchester City returned from the international break with a tricky tie against Burnley at the Etihad Stadium. Will they get their desired victory? Find out this Saturday when Manchester City take on Burnley on the Premier League line. Showing on the network service of the NTA from 2.30pm. The Premier League Live is brought to you by Baba Ijebu and powered by Integral. Right, you're welcome back and it's still good morning nigeria live on the network service of the nigerian television authority uh let's uh, return to our guests in the abuja studio sunday okay well, you know one of the points that has been raised in the course of this conversation has to do with uh, well the seeming inefficiency in in, in tax collection uh Menasara was saying something that uh, some of us are quite familiar with in the past he said if you went down to the grassroots uh, you saw evidence of government, and then you also saw citizens' responsibility uh, to their duties. One of the civic duties is to pay tax. But they also made a point that these days, and particularly in recent decades, uh, revenue collectors have tended to be uh, unwilling to leave their comfort zones, particularly in the city. One evidence for this, you go to some shops or some markets, uh, you will just see the stores, Sometimes you, you will see like photocopies of 10 revenue collector's receipts stapled on, and you are asking yourself, what is all of this for? I'm sure you must have seen that yourself, Mr. But, but simplicity, in the meantime, there are several other sources on tap. There are farmers who are farming. There are workers in the rural locations. Mm -hmm. There are persons in remote locations. There are Okada riders. There are all, all kinds of people. There are bus drivers. There are, so uh, why is it? necessarily the case that revenue collectors appear unwilling to leave their comfort zones to say drill down and say don't impose new taxes just enforce what is available already in the books well, all right thank thank you so much um i listened to the guests at the lagos today and what um, my co-guests in abuja had said regarding that um i think in the i can speak authoritatively about my organization, which is the FIRS. Uh, but we have also established here this morning that the tax collection is not a matter exclusively for the FIRS. So it is only where and on who you have jurisdiction. That is what we can collect. And that is what we, as the FIRS, limits ourselves to. Um, so having said that, everywhere in Nigeria where we ought to have an office we do have cost of governance is also one thing that you need to manage so that there you have to strike a balance so that you are not expending more than your income so as a surface that covers the entire nigeria it is practically impossible for frs 
to have offices in north villages and towns. But we have offices and each of them have jurisdiction. No, there is no state in Nigeria that we are not present and there are officers there. So if they need to go to the nooks and crannies of the state, they do go there. And uh, the taxes that are administered by the service have specific time by which taxpayers are expected to render most of these taxes. So when you wait for your taxpayer on the due date and he has not paid maybe a week after you begin to chase him, either by telephone, either by phone call and all of that, to get him to come to comply. So that we do. For the states, I know that um, I do also, because when we leave the city, we also go to the villages where we come from. I do also see some presence, but I will not be able to really measure the efficiencies because I am, I, I am not resident there. But in terms of the impact of the government, I think we are all in it together. The taxman, whether at the federal, the state, or the local government, is also a taxpayer. And I agree that there should be seen benefits for taxes being paid. And when we talk of the social contract, that is exactly what we're saying. Government has a social contract with the citizenry. Pay your taxes, I will do this, I will do that. We all know as a country that we need infrastructure, we need to develop. We need an egalitarian society. Security of lives and property are paramount. So, but which comes first becomes the question. It is, it is a long debate of the egg or the chicken. Which one comes first? So, but I want to say that each party, the government, the citizen must do what is required of them. It helps the taxman to do his work effectively, to be more effective in doing it. As for many, maybe some officers may not want to leave the comfort of the city and go to the villages. Uh, if that is correct, it may on, not be only limited to the tax administration. And one of the reason behind that is because some of the comfort that you find in city should also be in the rural areas. It should be there. When you get to advanced cities and advanced countries, I mean, you get to their villages, everything you need in the city is available. There is light, there is water, there, I mean, the roads are, they may not be as wide as you have in the city, but they are passable and they are good. So if we have that, then people who are supposed to go meet the rural farmers, meet the rural traders, they will be there. I understand that sometimes the, even the local government, maybe they stay only at the local government headquarters, which is more or less the most developed town in that city. So that closeness to the taxpayer is actually important. And we can help ourselves, our citizens, and our government need also to help us. Thank you. Indeed, thank you so much. Let's go back to our Lagos studio with uh, Tayo Oyadele, who is a fiscal policy partner and Africa trade leader. I'm going to, let's broaden this conversation a little and um, taking into cognizance as we begin to diversify the economy. As an Africa tax leader, let's look at the Africa Free Trade Agreement. Business from other countries and goods and services will be trooping into Nigeria. If we cannot get our tax collection right in Nigeria, how do we make others who come into this country with their goods to pay the tax that is needed to diversify the economy and increase our revenue generation? Yeah, thank you. Very, very good question. Yeah. So we have to always put our, yeah, our house in order uh, so that when other people come, they can then take a cue from what we are doing to ourselves. So if you're a landlord or the head of the home and you don't put your home in order, when you have a guest, they will also behave the way you are behaving. So if you point a finger at them, then obviously the remaining four will be pointing at you. Uh, this is the reason why in Nigeria we find it so convenient to blame multinationals and then we even blame the Lebanese and the Indians for not doing things the right way, but they just are learning from us. So that's really important. For the African continental free trade area, we I don't know there's any country in Africa that is ready 100%. But we have to be getting ready every day than the previous day. 
And we can look for a million and one reasons why it cannot work. Uh, but there are far more reasons why it can and it should work uh, for the sake of everyone, including our small businesses. Uh, so we focus on we don't have infrastructure, which is true, but you cannot build infrastructure overnight. So strategically, Nigeria today is a service economy because the component of services of our GDP is more than 50%. Services require less infrastructure for you to compete. So if you think about our lawyers, you think about accounting services, in fact, think about ICT, think about entertainment, the creative sector. These are the areas where, as a country, we have both comparative and competitive advantages, and we should start exploring them. How can we you know, become the innovation center for Africa? How can we drive things to do with, even take petroleum and the energy sector? Uh, how can we drive the investment in renewable energy for Africa out of Nigeria? How can we get China and the rest of the world who are exporting finished products to Africa to actually come and set up in Nigeria and other key markets, produce here for Africa and export from here to the rest of the, of the, of the continent? So these areas are very important today. You know, every time I, I talk to business uh, owners and they lament about the nightmare of wanting to import anything to Nigeria, which is even more complicated when you want to export. It's almost like we're a country where we really don't care about trade. We just want to complain and move on to the next thing to complain about. Some of these issues are really to do with overregulation. Some of them are to do with policies that are archaic and out of date. Some of them are to do with red tape that have been created just so some things can be difficult and some individuals can benefit from the chaos that we have in the environment. We cannot afford for that to happen with the AFCFTA because whatever we don't do, there are other countries who are less capable in terms of science and resources that would easily position themselves for those opportunities because, like they say, uh, nature does not want there to be a vacuum. But I think Nigeria still has the golden opportunity now to begin to lead the conversation around the African continental free trade area as the largest economy within the continent and to also build capacity so that we can take opportunity of those, uh, you know, privileges and advantages under the, under the treaty to be able to boost our own economy and by extension help boost the economy of, of Africa. In one of the analyses that I did, I, I looked at the top 10 countries in Africa and I looked at what they were importing from other countries. It was interesting that eight of them, the number one item they were importing from anywhere in the world was refined petroleum products. And where were they importing from? From the rest of the world, not even Africa. Just imagine today that Nigeria can start producing 2.4 million, 2 million barrels, and we decide not to export a single barrel but we refine everything and then take care of our local consumption and then export the refined product to the rest of Africa. Under the FCFTA, it means that there won't be duties, so we'll be more competitive when the products get to those other African countries. We earn a lot of foreign exchange. The pressure on our foreign reserve will go down, and even far, the value of Naira would even appreciate that even if you are selling petrol at the market price, the price is likely going to be lower than it is currently. So some of these issues require a lot of policy intervention, policy coordination, and we need to be deliberate so we don't take one step forward and then take two backwards. Can you respond to that? Uh, yes, uh, there are so many issues there. You see, we are talking about African uh, Free Trade Continental Agreement under Articles 4, 6, 7, 8, and 11. It talks about a lot of things that African as a continent should really think of entrenching first before we talk about free trade. Number one is that we should have regional security. Number two, we should talk about uh, international stability. In other words, in a situation whereby Japan, for example, or India or China will be saying Japan-Africa relations, they are not seen as, as individual independent sovereign countries but they are grinding us off as one entity it is wrong each nation should be considered as its sovereign nation based on its own potentialities you have to think of regional security you have to think of 
road network. As far back as 1975, there were a series of agreements from Addis Ababa to Pretoria, from uh, Dakar to, uh, 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 what do you call it, Egypt. There are all these provisions there on the paper, uh, 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 linking off of all the capitals of the uh, nation countries in Africa with railway lines, with trunk A road, with all those things. And then there are institutions uh, there that are supposed to help in this thing. African Development Bank, for example, is supposed to assist to us economic integration. We should have uniformity of currency, which is even difficult for us to have uniformity of currency within the West African sub-enclave. And then there are institutions there, for example, the customs, the immigration, the race. These are institutions that are supposed to be the facilitators. Facilitators rather than thinking of themselves as just revenue ag generating <coughs> agency. They are more or less thinking of the revenue to generate rather than thinking of the international obligation they are having uh, to dispense within the local or international macro particular location they find themselves as a body that is supposed to facilitate services. And then we don't have a coordination regarding our market products, regarding the, our market drive, regarding our this, and then the neglect in some critical sectors. Uh, when you talk of West Africa, when you talk of Central Africa, when you talk of South Africa, including the North Africa, the greatest of their endowments is in solid minerals. And there is none of these regions that is thinking of partnership with Bangkok is the international headquarters of solid minerals. We have the most precious type of gold in the world. Second most precious type of uranium next to the one in the Persian Gulf. We have it here in West Africa and in Southern Africa. We are not ready to explore the diamond the uh, sapphire, the aquamarine, the uh, quarantine, so many of the endowed mineral resources we are not having. So the most important thing is that we may have it as a blueprint, but when you don't have quality, standard, robust leadership that to be able to penetrate the international uh, frontiers, to be able to put Africa on its correct pedestal, then we will continue to leave it there as a theoretical, uh, theoretical per, per phenomenon. So we uh, must uh, evaluate uh, uh, the uh, leadership. Right. Uh, yes. let, let me pause you in the meantime, yes. because I was getting pressed for, uh, uh, to, to wrap up this, this conversation. Let's go back to Lagos. Uh, uh, Mrs. Ahile uh, Abangbe, there are a number of issues that uh, all uh, four guests have raised today with respect to optimizing uh, current uh, taxable uh, avenues. Now, uh, I Ode sorry, uh, Oyedele, uh, with you there in Lagos studio, raised the point that we are fairly familiar with, that there are a number of eligible taxpayers, but who are paying taxes to non-state actors. Uh, how do we overcome that? because it remains a major challenge. I mean, the other day, uh, tanker drivers were threatening to go on strike uh, because, according to them, the roads are bad, X, Y, Z. But if you were to call the tanker drivers and ask them for their tax, uh, personal income tax certificates, you will see that uh, it's, it's virtually empty. Uh, but in the meantime, they pay to their unions. They pay to uh, whichever chapters to which they belong. Go to the motor park. The other day, I think one of the uh, motor parks was reporting to uh, have a revenue of over two billion naira. So how can the government achieve a break-in without necessarily destabilizing the governance arrangements uh, in some of these entities so that non-state uh, actors do not continue to be the receivers of taxes, as it were? That's one leg. The other leg is also a very critical one. Uh, Ty will raise it, namely, it appears that we have a multiplicity of government agencies that are hankering after revenue, whereas the revenue authorized the authorized revenue collector uh, is left on the side. So you find you are looking for permit, they will charge you. You are looking for that one, they will charge you. So they get more interested in collecting revenue than in their regulatory function. But the first one I would like you to deal with has to do with how to achieve a break-in by governments at all levels. Uh, into the regime of non-state actors collecting humongous revenue? The answer is very simple. And I'll use a case of two states, Kaduna and Niger. Niger because that's more recent. Um, in Kaduna, for example, it was so simple. What did the government do? They centralized their IGR collection. So they looked at their, they looked at their, their collection and said to themselves that, you know, something is wrong here. So they started with the law, and which is also one, some of the things that the subnationals can consider. They reviewed their, their, reven their state revenue code. 
and said to themselves, okay, let's centralize our revenue collection. Let's centralize in a manner where when somebody walks in to pay, we have visibility as to all the revenues that are being generated, whether it's um, motor park, whether it's um, hospital license, whether it's, um, whether it's PIC, whether it's development levy, and that centralization shut up their revenue. Do, they did nothing else other than that for a few years, and it shut up their revenues very significantly. In recent time, the guy from Ninja also did something similar. He said, okay, can I just even have a central focus on what the revenue I'm generating from my state looks like? And that also, it, we use a palace in, um, in public sector, which means you close the tap, you know, because that means you have sort of closed the tap of corruption and the tap of leakages even within the state. And with that, the state can do much more than it could achieve, you know, um, with little revenue because the taxes have been, um, have been stolen at different levels. Secondly, um, we talked about earlier with respect to collection agencies. We need to, a lot of the state government, a lot of the subnationals, you know, because one of the things, mandates that we've done at FRS is say to ourselves that we would no longer use tax collection agencies as well, you know, so, but we still have a lot of subnationals doing this. So you have tax collection agencies where the agreements are ridiculously absurd. We had a municipal where the, where the, even the data for the state, the data for the municipal doesn't even reside with the local government. The local government had no idea how many taxpayers were in his locality. He had no idea how much was generated. He just knows that, oh, the state, the, 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 the tax agent gives me back the balance after taking off his own, um, his own, um, ta his own, what do you call it, his own commission. You know, so there is no transparency in that process. And like Malam Umar was saying, go back to the basics. You have employees. Equip them, educate them, bring them up, and let them be your agents in the field. Let them be your people that go to the field to speak to your taxpayers. Because even when they come to talk to your taxpayers, the, the professionalism is different compared to when an agent goes to talk to the taxpayers. Thirdly, I would say is you need to, they need to look at their laws. You know, because when you look at the laws of some of the states, some uh, at the subnational level, some laws even still have us paying taxes in cowries, in cows, using currencies that Nigeria doesn't use any longer. So how are they looking at their laws within those subnational saying, can I look at my revenue code? Are there things in my revenue code that do not, do not, shouldn't be there anymore? What can I do from that perspective? I would also say, you know, that a, um, a digitalization of the tax function. While this may be very expensive, and this is really where the role of the Joint Tax Board will come in, you know, because some of these states do not really generate a lot of revenue to enable them to digitalize their tax, you know, their tax function as efficiently as they want. But they have a body like the JTB. They have the big brother in the FRS. They have bodies that they can get data from. You have data in um, NIN, you have data in CBN, you have data in uh, NIMSI, so these are places where they can actually plug into to get data from that then enables them know who am I taxing, what am I taxing, and at how much are those taxes. And finally, I would say Kingsley is that the, our government, our officials in government, our governors, our leaders will need to lead by example. I would like to know how much the governor of my state pays as taxes, right? Because then he can make an example of an evader because they also need to lead by example. It's very, very critical that we lead by example. It's only when we lead by example that we can make examples of evaders. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, uh, thank you very much, Hile uh, Adetola Abangwe, for uh, your insight. Uh, of course, you are a fiscal policy expert and non-executive board member of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. It, it, it might appear that we have uh, scratch the surface of, of this subject matter. It's one we'll have to return to Definitely. subsequently. The number of your sign-off point just now was very significant. Uh, it is not sufficient to blame the citizens for not paying taxes. We also, uh, as managers of the polity, uh, play our own part. Hila uh, Abangwe, once again, a deep appreciation to you. Uh, thanks also to uh, Taiwo Oyedele, fiscal policy partner and Africa tax leader at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Thank you very much. Uh, again, a number of matters you placed on the uh, on the plate. We haven't been able to uh, have a bite, not able to chew on them. Once again, we will return to these issues at some point. Again, we uh, thank you for being around. Here in the studios, 
Big thanks to I mean, Nasara Kugo Umar, a lawyer and international affairs analyst. Thank you very much uh, for dredging up our experiences in the past and what we should do better. family member. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> Sunday Okewo, Acting Director, Special Tax Audit Department of FIRS. Thanks also for you. your contribution to our discussion. Thank you. All right. So uh, that's it. Uh, that's only for us on Good Morning Nigeria today. Tomorrow is another day. 7 o'clock in the morning. Join us then. I'm Kingsley Osabelo. And I am Juma Yusuf. Enjoy the rest of the day.